Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone, and I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and it is a blessing to be back preaching here. It's not that I didn't enjoy preaching in the Philippines. That was a great experience. Um, but it's good to be here. It's good to be back. Um, we have kids in the service, which is fun. And uh, each week that we have kids in the service, we try to do something, you know, as an illustration that kind of relates to them. This morning, I'm going to start with something a little bit different. I'm going to appeal to the kids who were kids, teenagers <laughs> in the late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> and as you can tell, they are the rowdier group. Um, <laughs> People certainly of my age will remember when this character first appeared on television. Uh, this is Jordy LaForge, played by LeVar Burton. Uh, it certainly seems appropriate on the weekend that we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11's landing on the moon that, uh, that we think fondly about Star Trek. Um, <laughs> Jordy was on Star Trek The Next Generation, and can anyone tell me what was unusual about him? He was blind. Yeah, he was blind. And it's really an interesting story. Gene Roddenberry, who is the series creator, and if you remember, in season one, Jordy was the navigator. And that was intentional, because Gene loved the idea of having a blind navigator. Now, because Jordy was blind, he was fitted with this special funny-looking visor that allowed him to function very effectively. In fact, because of that visor, although he couldn't see things the way someone who was not blind could see them, there were things he do and accomplish that someone who didn't have the, that visor would never be able to do and accomplish. It is an interesting metaphor an picture of an important part of our spiritual life. Everyone, everyone in this room, including me, everyone outside of this room is afflicted with spiritual blindness. It comes in different forms or there are different areas in our lives where it affects us. But there are ways that we don't see the world correctly. Our spiritual blindness shows up in things like unhealthy relationships and, and how we relate to others and misplaced values and wrong ways of thinking and, and in confusion about how we relate to God. But God has provided, with some, provided us with something that works very much like Jordy's visor. It corrects us, it guides us, it helps us to see things more correctly and it protects from the consequences of spiritual blindness. And this is something that is described in the passage that Taylor read for us this morning, Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 28. Now, we're in week six of our series, Define the Relationship. This is a series that focuses on who the church is and what the church is supposed to do. And through this series, we hope to gain a better understanding of who we are, who FBC is as a church, and what it should be doing as a church. Now, let me introduce a summary that captures this series. The church is a family of believers who are built by and belong to Jesus, united and set apart for the purpose of worshiping God and proclaiming the gospel. That is what the church is. That is what the church does. And that fundamentally is what FBC must be all about. Now, let re, let's review real quick. In week one, we saw the fact that it is Jesus who builds the church. In the next week, we started um, looking at common metaphors for the church. And the first one that we looked at is that the church is a family. And what that means is that we have intimate relationships with one another that comes from a shared identity that we have in Christ. Jesus is building the church he is building a family of believers. 
I pointed out that this is actually where we get a healthy view of church membership. Church membership is a declaration. It is a statement to one another that we are committed to one another like we are committed to family. Then we looked at the church as a body. Here we saw that the church is made up of many diverse members with different gifts and different personalities and different backgrounds, but they are all united by Jesus. And week four, we saw that the church is a temple. The church is set apart as God identifies with his people and dwells among them. And the church is a place where God is worshiped. And then last week, Slade introduced the church as a people. You could think about the Lord as an embassy of God's people into the world. And it's because we claim the truth of God's kingdom. This week, we're going to look at our final metaphor of the series before we transition into what the church does. And we're going to look at the church as a flock. The metaphor appears in Acts 20. And the context of Acts 20 is Paul is talking to the leaders, the elders, it says in verse 17, of the church in Ephesus. So this is the leadership of a particular local church. And Paul is in the middle of a speech to them. And in the middle of this speech, he develops this metaphor of the flock. And he uses this metaphor to explain how God uses leaders to protect the church. He uses the metaphor to show that the church is a church under attack. And then he also identifies how God blesses that leadership and blesses the church. But let's start in verse 28 with the fact that the church is a protected flock. Now, verse 28 is where he introduces this image of the flock, a bunch of sheep. Now, this is the part where the pastor usually makes some crack about sheep being stupid. And what does that say about us? And we kind of laugh at ourselves for that, and then we kind of look, well, sheepish. Um. <laughs> but that's actually not the point that Paul is making here. That's not what he's emphasizing about sheep. What he is going to highlight is that the vulnerable, the church is vulnerable, just like sheep. They face serious threats, and they need protection. And in verse 12, what Paul does is he establishes that that protection has been set out, has been put in place by God. The term that Paul uses here is overseers. And that emphasizes that the elders are to be guardians, protectors, rulers, caregivers. If you were to look up that word in Greek, that's what it would mean. They are guardians, caregivers, protectors, rulers. And the only way Paul says to do this is as if they pay attention. In fact, that's the command in the verse. The command in the verse is for them to pay attention, to be alert, to be ready for whatever might come. Isn't it interesting that in this verse, there are two things that he tells them that they must pay attention to. And the first one is themselves. They must pay attention, be alert, be aware of what is going on with them spiritually. They cannot function as overseers if they are not alert and paying attention to their own spiritual well-being. The second thing that he tells them to pay attention to is all of the flock. Every member of that church, every member of that flock needs their care. Every member of that church needs their guidance and needs their protection. Paul wants them to see that this is not optional. The Holy Spirit himself placed them in this role. Whatever else might have gone into how they became elders, Paul says, bottom line, it was the Holy Spirit who put you in this role at this time. It's not saying that the elders spoke with the voice of God and were without error. It's not saying that the elders were perfect. Ironically, right before this service, standing in the lobby, I had a conversation with Ben Rimpel. That's not ironic. But um, what's ironic is Ben told me the story about a pastor that he met one time years ago. And he said this pastor told him whenever he stepped in the pulpit, everything that he said, whatever he said, was the voice of God. 
Why are you surprised by that? Um, well, you should be. That's not what Paul is saying here. These people are not perfect. They are fallen and sinful just like everyone else. They are prone to error just like everyone else. But what it is saying is that God himself entrusted them with this responsibility. I think that's really helpful to remember. If true leaders are to care for and protect every individual in the flock, that sometimes they have to have hard conversations with people. And sometimes, I can tell you from experience, that the response you get goes something like, who are you to tell me this? Or something like, what gives you the right to speak into my life? And the answer is in verse 28. The answer is the Holy Spirit placed me in a role where that is my responsibility. I'm not perfect. I might be wrong. But what I don't have the option of is to do nothing. See, if the offensive line coach on a football team sees a player that's using a blocking technique that is going to get him interested, that offensive line coach does not have the option of saying, you know, I'm not the head coach. I'm just going to let it go. No, the head coach puts you in this position for a reason. He puts you in this position to help your players and to protect your players. Go protect them. The point is reinforced by the ending of the verse. The flock belongs to God because it was purchased by God through Jesus' death on the cross. The Ephesian church was a cherished, invaluable treasure that God purchased at an extremely high price, the highest of all prices. And so God placed leadership in the Ephesian church precisely because the church is precious to God. And the same is true at FBC. You see, Paul's point to the Ephesian elders is that the Holy Spirit put them in this role to care for and protect their church. And as a result, they have the responsibility to be on the alert about their own personal well-being as well as the spiritual well-being of the church. And then the next two verses explain why this is so important. It's because the church is a flock that's under attack. Verse 29 actually tells us the first of two different types of attack. The sheep's biggest enemy is the wolf. Paul pictures vicious wolves entering the flock and ripping the shrimp, sheep, the shrimp, that too, <laughs> the sheep to pieces. The Ephesian elders had to be on their guard because after Paul left, there would, they were going to be, these leaders were going to be the defense now, based on other things and other places where Paul has addressed the Ephesians, it's almost certain that what he's talking about with these wolves are false teachers that would come into the church. And after Paul leaves, people from outside the church would come in and try to change the teaching of the church and take it away from the truth of the good news of Jesus and the gospel of grace. And this would destroy the church, and it would destroy the individuals within the church. It would be like wolves running among unprotected flock of sheep, and the sheep have no chance of surviving. There's a church that less than 10 years ago, it's one of the largest churches in America, it was extremely influential. Its lead pastor was very famous. You would probably know his name. And that church no longer exists. Somewhere along the way, people came into the church who insisted that this church should be run like a business. The gospel of grace was preached from the pulpit, but it was no longer lived out in the lives of the church. Volunteers were treated poorly if they weren't high performers. Staff was given goals for what they should achieve in terms of attendance and giving and were treated poorly if they did not reach those goals. After the church blew apart, people looked back and said, how did this happen? And it was really traced to a mindset 
that came from a few key people who came into the church and wielded influence. They had an agenda. And that agenda caused people, although it was well-meaning, I'm sure, it caused people on staff, it caused volunteers to feel beaten up, unloved, and used. It became so bad, the culture and the environment in that church became so bad, it actually made national news repeatedly. Countless people were devastated. Eventually, the church could not continue, and it disbanded. All because no one in leadership, no one was willing to say to these few people, a church is not a business. The goal is not efficiency. It is transformed lives, and that is messy and painful, and it is massively inefficient. The goal is to glorify. And you can never, ever make that quantifiable. You can never reduce God's glory to God's sheep. No one took that stand in the church, and the wolves destroyed the flock. Verse 30 talks about a different kind of threat. It's a threat that comes from within the flock itself. Paul describes men who will come from the flock, who will speak twisted things with the goal of gaining personal followers. Again, the twisted things almost certainly refers to false teaching, teaching that denied the gospel. And these people who are subtly undermining the teaching of the church are trying to gain their own following and draw people away from the solid gospel and a solid church. Who's this guy? Sour mom. He is sour. He's a mom. Okay. Good guy or bad guy? Trick question. He started as a good guy, didn't he? In fact, Gandalf referred to him as wise. But over time, even this character One small step at a time, Saruman developed a very wrong and twisted way of thinking. Saruman didn't start out wanting to be a bad guy. And I suspect that every step that he took, he thought he was doing the right thing. The problem was that there was no one who caught it in time and kept him from wandering down the wrong path. And one of the best good guys became one of the most destructive bad guys. And that is why spiritual blindness is so dangerous. We might not realize what is happening to us. And we need someone to say something. And this danger is massive. It is massive in churches today. People who start well and have great motives become massively destructive. And sometimes it's the pastor. Right when I finished seminary, Ann and I were in the Pacific Northwest. We were in Oregon. And I met with the district supervisor of the Evangelical Free Church for the Pacific Northwest, a seasoned, wise pastor and supervisor And he had some advice for me. And one of the things that he said was, you must guard yourself from the temptation to make yourself indispensable from the church. He said, it is incredible. Every pastor deals with the temptation of wanting the church to think that they are indispensable. And what that ultimately does is it takes the focus off of Christ and the gospel and puts the focus on the pastor. And when the pastor crosses that line, he will become manipulative, he will become demanding, he will stop saying what people need to hear and say what people want to hear. And your people will suffer because they stop hearing the truth. And so it's extremely important to me that the leadership of this church is always, always able and free 
to tell me when I'm even subtly going off track. But the threat doesn't just come from pastors. It can come from congregations. I saw a church split when someone in the congregation rallied, around, uh, rallied people around him because he thought the senior pastor should spend 40 hours a week in the office and never out meeting with people. I remember the rallying cry of, I want to be able to call the church any single time and know that the pastor is in his office. You're out of luck if you're in the hospital. I saw a church split over that. I seen division in a church when someone in the congregation rallied people because he was tired of hearing the gospel preached every Sunday. What he wanted were sermons to be practical advice for better living. And so he rallied people around him and that group left the church for a church that gave motivational speeches. People who went to the new church were happy, but the reality is they were not getting the biblical truth that they needed to grow in Christ. And in the long term, they suffered. These churches suffer in part because no overseer said to that congregant, what you are doing is sinful and it will damage you and it will damage the church. And I love you enough to protect you from yourself. And I love the church enough to have the hard conversation to protect it. The Holy Spirit sets leadership in place to care for and protect the church. And there's good reason for that. The church faces attack from within and from without. And these threats will damage the church and the lives of the people in the church. But the good news is that that leadership is not left on its own. Verses 31 and 32 promise a blessed leadership. Verse 31 repeats the command from verse 28. The elders need to be alert. Now Paul tells them how to be alert. Remember Paul's example. You see, the first blessing that the Ephesian elders received was Paul modeling for them what it meant to care for and protect the church. And what 31 tells us is that Paul constantly, day and night, admonished the church. It does not say that Paul day and night inspired the church. It does not say that Paul day and night gave the church to-do lists. It does not say that Paul day and night organized the church. It says he admonished the church. What does that word admonished mean? It means to warn people away from sin or to correct people who are in sin. What is this verse saying that Paul did? Paul, day and night, had conversations with people about their sin. But notice how he did it. He did it with tears. You see, what Paul is saying is that these leaders need to follow his example. They need to enter into those hard conversations. They need to be willing to say, I know that what you are doing seems good to you, but you are on a path of destruction. But they need to do it grieving over the sin that the person is in and the pain of having to have this conversation. Let me ask you a question. What do you think would happen to churches in America if the pastors and elders actually applied this verse the way Paul means it? I can tell you why this is very hard for pastors to apply this verse. They do not want to be unemployed. So here's your gut check question. Is there anyone in the church that you would listen to If they came to you like Paul. Is there anyone that you would listen to. If they came to you with humility and love. And said what you are doing does not reflect the character of Christ. If there is no one in this church. Specifically no one in leadership. Whom you would humbly listen to. That does not mean you have to agree with them. But you would take them seriously. Seriously. 
then you have cut yourself off from one of the most important tools that the Holy Spirit has put in place to help you grow more like Jesus. Is there anyone that you would listen to, that you would not unfriend on Facebook? If they came to you and said, I'm concerned about what you're doing here, let's talk. Paul ends this part of his speech with a word of blessing, which is what he means when he says, commend you to God. It means literally to set you in front of God. He's telling the elders that he is entrusting them to God, knowing that God will care for them just as these elders will care for the church. And what is going to build the elders up and what is going to build the church up is the message of the gospel. The message, the constant reminder that God loves us and pursues us in our sin and in our failings. But he doesn't leave us there. He changes us into who we were meant to be, imitators of Jesus. That's what the word sanctified means. A way of thinking about it is it means to become more like Jesus. God is doing the work of sanctifying everyone who is a follower of Jesus He's doing it with the elders, the overseers, and he is doing it with the flock that they oversee. The flock needs to be cared for and protected. There are threats from without and there are threats from within. And God has placed people in leadership who are responsible to do that work of caring and protecting. But fundamentally, it is the good news of the transforming power of Jesus that builds builds up the leaders and sanctifies the flock. Like the church in Ephesus, FBC is a church under authority. And I want to take a second to explain what this looks like. So it'll help us pray for FBC and its leaders. And by the way, let me just make a quick advertisement. We are doing 40 days of prayer, and each week we are praying for a different segment of the church. If you didn't get one of these when you came in, It will take you through this. You can pick one up out in the foyer. It'll take you through this next week, and the next week is about praying for our leadership. You can also find this online and the phone app. If you have the phone app, you'll get daily reminders of how to pray. What does this look like at FBC? Well, just like the church in Ephesus, FBC is an elder-led church. We have a team of elders who serve three-year terms. This group is responsible for the spiritual care and protection of the church, not just as an institution, but everyone who has made it clear to us that we are their spiritual family. This is the group that is responsible for that role of overseers. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul talks about this group in other places. And in two places, 1 Timothy and Titus, he gives a list of requirements. What are the qualifications to be an elder? And here's just a bullet point list from 1 Timothy. Now, I want to point something out about verse 1, because this is something that causes confusion. It is okay to aspire to the role of overseer. I have heard for years and years that what qualifies someone to be an elder is that they don't want the job. Biblically, that actually comes from a famous book on leadership. Um, Biblically, what the Bible says is if you don't want the job, don't take it. There are some people who are afraid to become members of a church because they don't want to serve on the board. If that is you, here is your biblical permission to say no. I would rather you make it clear to the church that this is your spiritual family and become a member and then confidently standing on the truth of Scripture say, I do not aspire to that role. I am not a good fit. And the church had better respond with, and that's okay. That is okay. Acts 20 doesn't specifically address deacons, but they're an important part of biblical leadership in the church, an important part of FBC leadership. Acts 6, which if you have this prayer guide, you will go through 
part of Acts 6 where it talks about the earliest forms of elders and earliest forms of deacons. The role of the deacon that you see in Acts 6 was to care for the material well-being of the people in the church so that the elders, those in the earliest form of the elder role, could focus on the spiritual well-being of the people in the church. And we have this group of folks who serve as deacons at FBC, and they serve again on a three-year term. It's interesting that the qualifications to be a deacon are very similar to a qualifications to be an elder, but they're not identical. For example, there's no qualification to be a deacon that you need to be able to teach. Why is that? That's because deacons are not in a teaching role. Their role is to serve the needs of the congregation, the people in the congregation. Now at FBC, elders and deacons often work together in what's called the trustee board. The board handles many of the big picture issues in the church, things like budget approval, staffing issues, things like that. And don't let this freak you out, but there is absolutely nothing in the Bible about a trustee board. Um, but that's okay. We have found that it's simply a matter of wisdom to have these two boards come together on certain issues and work together. Of course, there are other forms of important leadership in the church. The staff is a huge one. In fact, if you look at what the Bible says about pastors and elders, it really appears that pastors and elders is a, are terms that are used interchangeably. Some would disagree with that, but it's certainly they're very closely tied together. And those in the pastoral roles at FBC have the responsibility to care for and protect the church through their teaching, through equipping of believers to serve, and yes, through the very hard and painful work of admonishing. We have an incredible team of administrative and facility staff that serve in many ways very similarly to elders or to deacons. They function to make sure that everything in the church runs smoothly day in and day out. They are also invaluable in supporting the care for people in the church and outside of the church. And obviously we can go beyond this to many, many different forms of volunteers, people who lead small groups, people who lead life groups, teachers in youth or children or other ministries in the church who all have a role in caring for and protecting the flock at FBC. These people function as important leaders and they guard and nurture the people in our church. And they are all people who need our prayer and our support. No matter what your role is, if you're in one of these positions, fundamental goal always is to care for the spiritual well-being of this flock and everyone that is within it. We will not do it perfectly, but it's what we're called to do. Acts 20 tells us the church is a flock. Paul uses that image with the elders of the Ephesian church to make the point that the church needs to be protected from threats that come from within and that come from without. And he also makes the point that God has put that protection in place and God has blessed that protection. And that protection is the church's leadership. And so the point this morning is that the church is a people under authority. And that is radically, radically countercultural. We want to be an authority unto ourselves. We don't want anyone telling me what to do. But you cannot live a healthy spiritual life if you have no one that will say to you, you got a blind spot here and it needs to be addressed. Jordy DeForge was a great character on Star Trek. He was a blind navigator. But there was one thing that was necessary for Jordy to accomplish everything that he accomplished. He had to know he was blind. See, and that's the problem with spiritual blindness. Every one of us has it. But we don't know where we have it. We are blind to our blindness. And that is why 
God places people in our lives, and he places spiritual authority in our lives and in the church. They care for and protect us by showing us where we are blind and what to do. We don't always know where we need help. We don't always know where we need to be protected, even from ourselves, until someone loves us enough to tell us. That is why God established leadership in the church. So how do we respond to this? Another thing that you received on your way in was a bulletin that looks like this. And on the back, there's a place that says, my next step today is, and it gives you ideas for how to respond. And I've summarized them up here. Encourage you to read Acts chapter 20, 17 through 38. That's actually the entire speech that Paul gives. And encourage you to find one thing from Paul's example that he talks about in this passage that you would like to imitate as you relate to the people of FBC. Share a word of encouragement, especially someone who has a spiritual authority in your life. If there is someone who does have that right and ability to speak into your life, it's not a bad idea to let them know. You are one of the people that I trust and that I open myself up to humbly to speak truth that others may not want to speak. Pray. Use this week's prayer guide to pray for FBC's leadership. And then go about the work of examining yourself. Pay attention to yourself for signs where maybe you are being drawn away from the Lord or you are being drawn away from his people that Paul warns about in verse 30. We're going to close in prayer today. In fact, I want to invite the prayer team to go ahead and come forward now. Why do we need to pray? We need to pray because I think we want protection, but we don't always want the authority that is given to protectors. In other words, we want people to keep us from harm. We just don't want people to tell us what to do. But in Acts 20, those two go together. That's one of the harms that we have to be protected from. So this group is here to pray for you no matter what you need at the end of the service. You can come forward, talk to them. They'll pray for you about a financial issue, relational issue. They will certainly want to introduce you to Jesus if you don't know him. But they will also pray for you to have the heart and humility that would allow you to have people in your lives who would speak the truth to you, even when you don't want to hear it. Let's stand Let's join in prayer together that we would be a church under authority. Heavenly Father, I think the core sin, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, is the sin of no one is going to tell me what to do. That I will be my own God. I will be my own ruler. I will make my own way. I will carve my own path. Yet, Lord, that is a way of living and thinking that will ultimately lead to our destruction. Thank you that you loved us enough that you put people in our lives who have the authority and responsibility to say, you're in danger. Stop. Go a different direction. And Lord, I never want to hear that. I do not like those conversations. Humble me. Soften my heart. Help me to receive hard words, knowing that they come from a desire to help me follow your son and be like him more fully. And Lord, I pray that for everyone in this church. Thank you that you love us so much that you tell us the truth.
pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's my final thought. God loves you so much that he will tell you the truth about the sins that ensnare you. So what is our job in response to a God like that? Our response is to open our hearts to receive the hard but life-giving words that set us free. You are dismissed.